Hi everyone, welcome back. So the purpose of this video is to look at the cardiovascular system and in particular cardiovascular pathophysiology. So already today we've looked at some of the more complex physiological principles that underpin the heart and the lungs, our whole CV system. Things like how pressure, volume and flow relate to each other, the concept of mean arterial pressure. Now this should all lead quite nicely into our more detailed understanding of pathophysiology. So we're going to look to begin with a bit of a topic overview of CV disease and we will look at a lot of topics that were covered in year one in very basic detail, maybe draw out some considerations that are relevant for paramedic practice but a lot of this should be topic revision and should make quite a lot of sense to you. What we will do is we will pull out a couple of topics that are maybe a little bit unfamiliar and we'll look at them in more detail using our underpinning principles from our CV physiology. So we'll talk a little bit about unusual MI presentations, things like posterior wall or right ventricular infarcts that might require not only an adjustment to our treatment process, but of a bit of an adjustment to our diagnostic process as well. And then we'll be able to tie it all up in a neat little package for you that should hopefully make a bit of sense. Now, as usual, there is a Padlet wall, so if you want to post questions, please do. We absolutely love when you guys get engaged with the Padlet, so engage with us throughout these online teaching days as best you can. If you have any other questions, you can email me, that's not a problem, and let's just dive into it. Let's look at cardiovascular disease, the great spectrum, as it is. So let's have a look. Okay, so we're going to start our overview of cardiovascular pathophysiology by thinking about the, the most common presentations, and then we'll look at some stuff that you maybe aren't as familiar with. So probably the most common cardiovascular presentation is going to be coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease. So what is this? Well, ischemia is poor blood flow. So this is poor blood flow to cardiac tissue or specifically to the musculature of the heart. And this is caused by this process of plaque accumulation or atherosclerosis. So atheroma, meaning gruel in Greek, is this buildup of fatty tissue, white blood cells, a lot of different things to cause this plaque that builds up outside the tunica intima. So the tunica intima is the inner vessel lining in our arterial system or in our venous system, but we're talking about the arterial system in the coronary arteries here. So there's this buildup of tissue. Now, I think people tend to simplify this and actually it is quite a complex topic that isn't completely understood. We believe that leukocytes uh, like monocytes and basophils attack the endothelium of the artery in cardiac muscle. This leads to some inflammation and that leads to the formation of plaques within the tunica intima. Now, the bulk of the, the lesion or the plaque is made up of excess fat tissue, cholesterols, collagen, and elastin. And when they first begin to grow, they grow and there's no wall thickening or any narrowing. It's just the plaque forms on the outside of the vessel. It's actually quite a long-term process and can extend over years and years. And we all have some level of atherosclerosis just because of our normal diet. But we know the risk factors to developing coronary artery disease. Things like smoking, poor diet, poor levels of exercise. All these things contribute along with a genetic predisposition as well. But as plaques mature, they start to cause narrowing of the artery. And you can see in this diagram here in the bottom right that some muscular cells have started to overgrow the lipids and the cholesterol. So we've actually got a really well-established plaque here that narrows the arteries. This process is called calcification. When vascular smooth muscle overgrows the muscular layer and starts to really stabilize the atheroma. And this is potentially a good thing if we can stabilize the atheroma and start from breaking, stop it from breaking off. But when they break off, so the plaque is large and it's unstable, it's being tossed about by the blood flow. Remember that the coronary arteries are under a decent amount of pressure, so there's a fair amount of flow there. The plaques can break off, and if the plaques break off, they form a thrombus. Now, if the thrombus travels distally and it blocks the artery further down completely, this is going to lead to a critically low or absent blood flow, which will lead to tissue damage and necrosis in the cardiac muscle. And we know that we call that myocardial infarction. So that's an overview of coronary artery disease. Nothing that you're not aware of, nothing that you don't encounter every single day in your practice. We're quite happy with that. 
Now, the extension of coronary artery disease is, of course, angina. And angina is the same process, just a different way of describing it. So we have stable angina. This is caused by stable plaques. And these patients will have chest pain. That's just due to transient tissue ischemia and low blood flow. And this will generally come on during exertion. So this is the defining factor for stable angina. Then we have unstable angina which is due to these dynamic or unstable plaques that may break off and thrombosis can be involved in this. So ischemia will come on at rest with these patients rather than under exertion, they'll have chest pain at rest. And this is a critical point where we need, we need these patients to be evaluated and potentially get an angiogram because they're potentially going to have myocardial infarction. And then, like we say, we know that the complete blockage of the artery causes death of myocardial tissue and an infarction. So we've talked a bit about the vasculature system, the vascular system of the heart. And this is, like I say, all assumed knowledge for this level. So the next thing we can start to talk about then is muscular abnormalities of the heart. And we call these myopathies or cardiomyopathies. So these are abnormalities in the heart muscle. And we're talking about where the muscle becomes enlarged, thickened, or stiff. Now, there are a group of diseases that affect the heart muscle. And we, we actually don't have time to talk about all of them. There's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. There's restrictive cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo or broken heart syndrome. There's loads of different types. And if you're interested, I encourage you to go and have a read because it's actually a really interesting area of cardiac science. But the ones that we're interested in are dilated and hypertrophic for this level because they have a, a large role in heart failure. So Dilated cardiomyopathy is where less blood is pumped because the ventricular wall is thin and it's weakened, and this can lead to systolic heart failure. Conversely, then, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is where less blood is pumped from the heart because the ventricles can't relax fully and the ventricles are thickened, and this leads to diastolic heart failure. Now, we've discussed the forms of heart failure, systolic versus diastolic, and we'll come to those in a separate session. But actually, if we look at the diagram, it makes a little bit more sense. So on the left, we have a normal heart here. With the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see how the cardiac muscles are thickened. And that's going to reduce the volume within the ventricles, meaning that we can pump less blood. With dilated cardiomyopathy, while the chamber size is preserved or in fact larger, the muscles are not strong enough to pump blood. And these both lead to types of heart failure. Now, cardiomyopathy is generally either confined to the heart or part of a sort of generalized disorder. Both can lead to cardiovascular death or heart failure related death. There are obviously other causes of heart muscle dysfunction and coronary artery disease definitely contributes to forms of cardiomyopathy. There are also familial or inherited forms of cardiomyopathy, certainly in children, things like a restrictive cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction, HOCAM, you may see more in children. Certainly dilated cardiomyopathies are normally seen in adults with poor cardiac function. So that's a, a very brief overview of cardiomyopathies. I think it's important to mention them because we don't really get a lot of education in cardiomyopathy otherwise, but we're talking about musculature abnormalities that cause a failure in pump function. So again, just directly related to heart failure. So then we have aortic disease. Now the aorta is the largest arterial vessel in our body. It comes out of the heart and extends down the torso. We have a thoracic aorta and an abdominal aorta and these provide arterial supply to our major organs. So it's a really important part of the arterial system. Now, the normal aorta is actually a really stable vessel. It operates under high pressure. So you can imagine that issues with it are going to lead to issues with potential rupture or aneurysm. So aneurysm then is this abnormal widening of the aortic wall. So we call it like an outpouching or a widening. And this can result in either thrombosis because of plaque formation and rupture or embolus. Now, the concern with aneurysm is rupture especially in the pre-hospital environment, these patients can have undiagnosed aortic aneurysms that may rupture spontaneously. These patients will die very quickly uh, simply because of the high blood flow through the aorta. And there's very little, unfortunately, we can do for that 
regardless of whether the aneurysm is in the abdomen or in the thoracic aorta. Although, depending on where the aneurysm is located and how big it is, may lead to different symptoms. You may also encounter patients who have diagnosed aneurysms, especially abdominal aneurysms, and there is a limit to surgical treatment. So many patients may be med medically managed perfectly safely by making sure that their blood pressure is within normal limits and surgical treatment is very invasive for this. So generally we'll try and avoid surgical treatment and go with medical management first. So you may encounter these patients pre-hospitally that have stable abdominal aortic aneurysms and that's nothing to worry about but it's definitely something to consider when it comes to your patient assessment. Then we have dissection. Now dissection is a rupture or a leak in the wall of the aorta and if we think about that diagram of the tunica intima this is about a rupture in the tunical layer of the vessel that will allow blood to escape out of the tunica intima and form like a false lumen inside the wall of the vessel. And I've actually got a good diagram for this in a wee second, so I'll show you. This can eventually lead to rupture. And again, just the same as with aneurysm, rupture can lead to death or extreme disability very quickly. So focusing in on dissection then. Dissection is very rare. It's about three in 100,000, but 50% of people with a type A dissection that involves the ascending aura uh, will die within three days thoracic aorta will die within three days dissection is very often linked to chronically high blood pressure and occasionally due to genetic factors like connective tissue disorders or aortic insufficiency where the aorta isn't uh, up to the job of dealing with the high pressures can be a tough diagnosis, especially clinically, pre hospitally where we don't have any sort of imaging tools or anything like that. These patients very much resemble acute chest pain patients, acute coronary syndrome patients, but they will often be very, very unwell. They'll have profound hypertension, shortness of breath, or a collapse. The key is to suspect it in acutely unwell chest pain patients. A good history taking process might allow you to get a bit of a clinical suspicion, but unfortunately we can't diagnose it pre hospitally now that diagram I was talking about a moment ago, that's it here up on the right. So you can see that a normal artery has a proper lumen with a, a tunica intima lining the inside of the vessel. On the right hand side, you can see how there's been a split in that tunica intima and it's allowed blood to escape between the intima and the tunica media, causing a, creating a false lumen and this weakens the vessel significantly. So the next condition we need to consider is peripheral vascular disease. Now, very similarly to coronary artery disease or indeed cerebrovascular disease, this is plaque formation or narrowing in some mechanism of the peripheral vasculature. So particularly in this case, not involving the coronary circulation or in the brain, we call it cerebrovascular disease. Same thing. This is all about impairment of blood flow in the peripheral arteries. Now, this can cause obstruction of large arteries. So if we're thinking about the kidneys, it can cause renal, we're talking about renal stenosis. So stiffening of the renal arteries causing impaired blood flow to the kidney or impaired blood flow to the arms, neck or legs. The classic symptom of peripheral vascular disease is sort of pain that resolves with rest. And this is called claudication or intermittent claudication. You may end up seeing patients with skin ulcers, blue and cold skin. Uh, the ultimate complication of this is tissue necrosis and death that may require amputation. And the greatest risk factor for peripheral vascular disease is going to be just the same as with coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease. It's smoking, poor lifestyle, poor diet, low levels of exercise. It actually has quite a high incidence, something around uh, five to 6% of patients over 50 uh, and something like 15 to 20% of patients 85 to 90. It's actually got quite high incidence and very much the same as previously mentioned, the cause is often atherosclerosis. There are other causes, things like arterial spasm, thrombosis, but generally it's atherosclerosis. 
And we need to be aware of this. Patients who have claudicated lower limbs, this becomes a bit of an emergency and these patients need resolution of good blood flow. And the same, you know, just a good assessment of peripheral vasculature making sure that patients have distal pulses is definitely worth it, especially patients that have risk factors for this disease. So worth bearing in mind. Then we have valvular disease. Now these are diseases involving one of the four valves of the heart, the aortic, the mitral, the pulmonic, or the tricuspid. So we have a few different types. And again, we could speak about this for a very long time, but the main ones we want to talk about, first of all, are valvulitis, which is just inflammation of the valves. And you get this with rheumatic fever. This causes damage to the valves themselves, and they may end up needing replaced through this. Now, I've actually linked to a great website on a stenosis of heart valves. Aortic stenosis is actually quite a common finding. Uh, and do you know what? It's really characterized by heart murmurs and we don't listen to heart murmurs a lot we don't have a lot of education on heart murmurs so i've directed you to a resource on aortic stenosis i really encourage you to spend some time with it because this is actually something that you will have almost certainly came across in your practice and not realized the incidence is actually very high in certain areas of the population if we have stenosis which is where the valve doesn't open properly regurgitation where it doesn't close properly. This can cause problems with outflow and inflow, blood backing up through valves, and it's often a result of overuse or really high systolic pressures. So high blood pressure, this can be an issue with. Now there's a few different signs and symptoms. Aortic stenosis may include some heart failure symptoms like dyspnea, regurgitation, similar symptoms. Uh, they all kind of link into heart failure symptoms, but it's good to think about valvular disease as being a potential presentation. And certainly you will come across patients who have had replaced valves or are due to have valves replaced. So worth thinking about. Then we have pericardial disease. Now, the pericardium is this sac that surrounds the heart, this sac that protects the heart from insult and from damage. And there's some fluid in there that allows the pericardial sac to move with the heart. But obviously, if there's a loss of fluid or disruption of the layers due to tissue inflammation, then we can end up with pericarditis, which is inflammation of this sac. Now, that can cause mechanical obstruction, restriction to the heart movement. We also have pericardial effusion, which is either fluid or blood. Hemopericardium would be blood filling the pericardial sac, and this can cause cardiac tamponade. Now, you guys are aware of cardiac tamponade and the mechanism. This can be life-threatening. So you might see cardiac tamponade by virtue of hemopericardium in stabbings or shootings to the chest. You may see pericardial effusion, which can cause life-threatening uh, restrictive tamponade. Very difficult diagnosis to make in the absence of thoracic trauma. So these patients will be critically unwell and will be collapsing in front of you. Generally, patients with trauma are going to be fairly well identified. Patients with a filling pericardial effusion uh, are going to be harder to diagnose. Muffled heart sounds are not a reliable clinical indicator, unfortunately. So we're going to have to rely on advanced care for that. But that is pericardial heart disease. Then I guess the last sort of umbrella term in this is congenital heart disease. Now there's a huge spectrum of these. Some of them you'll see in childhood, some of them won't present until adulthood, but they're actually a leading cause of death in children under a year. And this is a disorder of the heart or the blood vessels that's present at birth. Now you get shunts, you get coarctations, you get transpositions. It's actually, again, a very interesting area of medicine if you have time to have a look at it. So similar to what we spoke about in the pulmonary system, a shunt is where blood is moved from one place to another, potentially abnormally. A coarctation is an abnormal uh, narrowing of a blood vessel, and a transposition is where blood vessels may be moved into the wrong place. So often children are born with transposition shunts or coarctations. Different ones have different levels of survive, uh, survivability and these patients hopefully you'll never encounter because they'll be treated in hospital before they're sent home. But occasionally you may encounter these children or these patients. What I would say is particularly important about any congenital heart disease is we don't expect you to know all of them. If you have some very basic understanding of 
maybe one or two of them, then that's absolutely great. But it's totally unreasonable to expect a paramedic or any healthcare professional who isn't a specialist in these areas to have good knowledge. So Google is your friend here. If you encounter a patient with one of these diseases in the pre-hospital environment, I very much encourage you to look it up and get familiar with it as best as you can. Ask the patient or ask the parents who will often be experts in the particular condition that their child has. So this is all about good history gathering and using information as best as you can, but parents won't expect you to be an expert either. And I think it's better to be upfront about that. It's impossible to know about every disease process. So here's a few examples of them. Patent foramen ovale is where the foramen ovale, which is a, a hole within the heart, fails to close during a during gestation and this allows blood to flow in the incorrect direction so this is an example of shunt coarctation of the aorta is where there's a narrowed section of the aorta which obviously closes reduced blood flow to the thoracic aorta and to the tissues same thing with the ductus arteriosus the ductus arteriosus goes from the aorta into the vena cava but after birth if it remains open this causes a, a right to left shunt and tetralogy of fallow is a transposition. It's a mixed tetralogy, meaning four different issues. It's actually a very complicated uh, condition. So the aorta is transposed, so it emerges from both ventricles. There's this intraventricular septal defect, uh, which you can see here. There's a defect, which means that they're not closed. Uh, so there's free flow between the ventricles. There's an enlarged or thickened right ventricle and the pulmonary semilunar valve is stenosed, it's stiffened. So four different issues. This can all be corrected uh, with very, very complex surgery. Important to know that patients with tetralogy of Fallot, again, you may encounter them in the pre-hospital environment. You most likely won't. But if you did, uh, the parents will be very much up on how their child uh, requires care and how you might be able to care for them best. So parents are your best friend here with this one. So I guess the question is, what what haven't we covered? And we've covered kind of a wide variety of cardiac disorders in very basic terms, just to give you a rough idea of the pathophysiology. Again, like I say, this is a gross oversimplification of a lot of these, but that's the point. So we'll look at a few in detail from this point onwards. What haven't we covered? Well, we haven't covered electrical conduction problems because they are getting covered next week. When we talk about ECG, we've got a full day of teaching on ECG for you. And we've not really talked about heart failure, particularly again, because it's assumed knowledge. And we're going to talk a bit more about specific forms of myocardial infarction next. Now, again, if you have any questions on any of these, post them on the Padlet wall, comment, and I will absolutely get back to you and try and give you a bit more information. But I encourage you to do some of your own reading as well. So there's loads of great open access information on all these cardiac diseases online. Use a high quality source. But again, Google is your friend if you're interested. Thank you very much for your time. We'll speak to you later.